So a second scripture reading comes from John's gospel. This past couple of weeks we have been in a series called Scripture Comes Alive in which you interact with some stuff. Uh, We've done thank you cards and seeds and we gave you talents and next week we're going to celebrate those talents. So if you took talent Uh, I know some of you did because you combined with your Sunday school class. If any of you took talents next week, uh, go ahead and bring that uh, back or or write to me. Let me know sort of your story as to what you decided to to do uh, with those talents. And we'll uh, be able to have a a big celebration um, next week. Uh, but this week we had had plans to do something and, and our, our plan sort of changed mainly simply because we are, are gathering uh, at the table today for communion. So we don't need to do anything um, any more special than we already do. We do this once a month and, and we probably should do it more often to be honest with you. But, but we do this once a month in which we gather down here and we, are, are, we have something physical that we interact with with this bread and and with this cup and so we picked these I picked this scripture out and and you've already heard the first part of it you heard John 6 1 uh, through 15 Uh, Cindy read it to you and it's a story that you know Uh, it's the feeding of the 5,000 wires are all tangled up here Um, the feeding of the 5,000 John's version of this story now it's, each gospel has its own uh, little version of, of, of the feeding of the 5,000. In fact, a couple of the versions have a feeding of the 4,000 later on. So you have two different kind of feeding narratives that occur within the gospel. But John's gospel only has this in regards to Christ breaking bread. John's gospel does not have a story of the Last Supper. And so most scholars point back and they say, this is why he doesn't bother telling the Last Supper story because it's already being circulated. Everybody would already know it because of Matthew, Mark, and and Luke, the other gospels that were being written. Instead, John wants to point back to the feeding of the 5,000. And what happened there? Not just because of the motions and the action that, that Jesus partook in and did, but rather because of the explanation that Jesus gives afterwards. So I'm going to read that to you in a second, but I want to go back into this scene that we just heard about that Cindy read to us from, from, from John's Gospel, The Feeding of the 5,000. So a couple of things are going on here. This, this large group had gathered together to hear Jesus speak, and so we knew that Jesus was sort of a, a good teacher, and, and all these people were sort of coming around, and it starts to get late in the day. And, and as it starts to get late in the day, and there's something about a crowd, being in a crowd, tummies started rumbling. Maybe it was the disciples, maybe it was the, the other people that were there uh, on the field, but, but they started to get a, a little hungry. Uh, after this past week being with a, a crowd of people at times, when it was supper time, you knew it. Um, people get hungry. You know, it, was, it seems like when you gather together and you know a meal is supposed to be coming. And so, so it was the time of day in which they were supposed to have a meal together. And, and so they start getting hungry. And Jesus knew what Jesus was going to do. Um, but he was sort of testing, as he did, uh, as leaders are, are so inclined to do at times, is to, to sort of test uh, their, their followers and their, their disciples. And, and so he, he sort of asks a question in which he knows the answer to. You know, what are we going to do? He gives them a chance. Of course, they don't really follow through and, and do that good of a job because th- their response, especially Philip, you know, six months wages would not be enough to buy bread for each of them to have a little. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? Because that's what Philip did. Philip felt overwhelmed. Like he just got asked a question. And so it was like he was looking out at this massive crowd and was like, I have no idea how we're going to do this. In fact, and not even do I not know how, I don't know how we would pay for it. Because six months would not be enough. And... In response to that, another of the disciples comes and has a solution. And and he may not even know the the full extent of what this solution was. But he had an idea. You ever been a part of a group in which somebody came and they had like a wild hair solution and you're like, that's crazy. And then later on it worked. 
And, and it just so happens, and, and I, we've pointed this out to you before. I know Carol has because he preached this. I remember the sermon that he preached. I don't remember many sermons, but I remember his when he preached this. And, and that it, it's Andrew, the disciple Andrew, that brings the boy who has the fish and the loaves. It's the, the patron saint of our, our church name. We're St. Andrew's Parish. And so it's Andrew that provides something, something small, offers something very, what would seem inconsequential to Jesus that allows Jesus to do Jesus' thing. You should probably remember that as members here, as, as attenders of St. Andrew's Parish. So he gathers what he has and he, he blesses it. In, in the same way that we're going to bless this bread, he, he blesses it, he breaks it, he shares it, and then they take up, and they take up enough that they have 12 baskets filled. Filled. And the 12 is a significant number, of course, because he has the 12 disciples there, there were the 12 tribes. It's a number that, that sort of insinuates completeness, like it is done and not just done here but done in completion and John calls this one of the signs John doesn't use the word miracles because that's sort of what we want to look at we don't look at this and be like, ah this is a miracle 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 I love the miracles I can't explain them but I love them this is the point to how supernatural Jesus is and 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 how great and how mysterious is and 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 I think there's a place for that in, in time but but I like the word sign. I like John's use of the word sign because it points to something else. What does a sign do? A sign points to something. Listen, we, we, as you drive around town, look at the signs. The signs are going to tell you where you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to be doing or, or where you're supposed to end up in your destination. We need these signs that point to something larger. And that's what John is doing. This is pointing to something larger. This is pointing to something bigger than what is, is breaking bread and, and sharing and, and some fish. There's something bigger going on. And it just so happens that Jesus would go on to explain it. And so I don't really have to work very hard today to preach a sermon because Jesus preaches a sermon. So here's, here's his explanation for what has happened. So the, the, the disciples feed and they disperse and then the next day, this is where he picks up in the 22nd verse, the next day, the next day the crowd had stayed on the other side of the sea, saw that there had been only one boat there. So they also saw that Jesus had not gotten into the boat with his disciples, but that the disciples had gone away alone. And then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where he had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. You see, what they had eaten had sort of worn off. And quite possibly they were hungry again. And they knew where they had gotten the food the first time. So whether they were hungry or whether they were spiritually hungry, like needing that nourishment that Jesus had provided him for that day, we don't really know, but they go looking for him. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So we may not know that, but Jesus knows that. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that the Lord, that the God the Father has set his seal. Then he said to them, here we go, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God. Of God that you believe in him who has whom he has sent so they said to him what sign are you going to give us so that we may see it 
and believe in you? What work are you performing? This is the same group that had been fed the day before. How quickly they forget. We're not any different, friends. Our ancestors, they go on, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're calling back to the day in which Moses had, had prayed to God and, and manna had fallen down from heaven and they provided for them. What are you going to do, Jesus? I mean, if I were Jesus, I'd have been like, what am I going to do? What do you mean, what do I did? I did it yesterday. But thankfully, Jesus didn't like me. Then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, here's your sermon. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me and anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. Are you hearing this, friends? I will never drive away for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing at all that he has given me but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father that all who see the Son and believe in Him may have eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day. May God add God's blessing to the reading, to the hearing, to the understanding of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. So they came seeking something that they didn't even know they needed. Jesus knew, but they didn't. They came thinking they were looking for bread. For something that was going to, to nourish them in some way. I was thinking about this as far as, as bread was concerned. Like we, as, as, as human beings, there's, there's really only three things we need. I, I would argue that there is a fourth, but, but there's only three things that scientists would tell you we need. Uh, we need oxygen to breathe, we need water, and we need food. I would add love. I honestly believe we need love. Um, and I think that's what Jesus was insinuating there. That it's not just enough to come and to be fed because you're going to have to come and be fed again and again and again, exactly what I shared with the kids. But instead, what Christ was offering them that day was something much, much, much more profound. It was the love of God. You see, so in John's gospel, he doesn't reference the Last Supper because he doesn't need to. Because see, in the Last Supper, it, it was Jesus' way of gathering his disciples together and simply saying to them, listen, I will always be with you and, and I'm going to take this meal and forever after this day, you're going to, to remember me and my love anytime you break bread and anytime you share the cup. And so, well, as this body is broken, as this blood is poured out, you are reminded that you're loved. This is why we do it. This past week, I did the, the morning jump start for the kids in which I just got out there and yelled at them really loud to wake them up. And we did a call and response. And all it simply was uh, that we started with is what do we do? What we do 
is love. That's everything. That's everything. It's summed up in one word. It's love. It's love. Everything. And that's what Jesus was saying, is that the Father's love had been poured out for you, for me, for all of us. And in this way, as he gathered on the other side of that lake that day, as he took those loaves and those fish and he broke them, he reminded the people that he could provide something that no one else could. So when we gather together and we break bread, we're reminded of God's love for us. And we're reminded that God provides something that, that we all need, that we all cannot find anywhere else. That's God's love. Poured out. Broken. For you and for me.